Um, yes, actually, I've been, I've been thinking a lot about some of the things that you said a couple of weeks ago, and um, about arrogance, particularly, and um, I was, as I was thinking about it, it kind of seemed to me that arrogance has a pretty strong link to vulnerability, and I was wondering if you think that that's true, um, and if you would talk about those two, um, two things. You know, I can't pronounce the second word really well. It's <laughs> despite being here for half a century. Um, what do you mean by vulnerability? Um, I guess what I mean is that when I was think I was trying to think of you know where does arrogance come from and what is its function and. Um, it seemed to me that the function of that particular um, it's not an emotion, whatever it is, uh, mm -hmm. it can serve as like a protective mechanism and, you know, protection against what, you know, disappointment or, um, of the kind of vulnerabilities that are, you know, at play in our experiences. We know our kids when they were very, very little, like a couple of minutes ago, when they want to ask for water, it seems as if they have this feeling of entitlement, but it's not something that they're aware of. You know, it doesn't come with pride. It's quite innocent. They just haven't been civilized well. Maybe a good spanking will, you know, teach them a lesson, I don't really know. They also many times forget to use the word please um, as a way to express modesty and humility and respect and all that. I think as you enter into the adult world, you know, some temperaments have a very, very difficult time just being wrong, wrong, and expressing that they're wrong. It's, you know, it's just a temperament. That's just the way it works. And it takes them a while to actually switch and it actually makes them feel good by saying that they are in fact wrong. Um, you know, arrogance has its connection to false pride to some extent. You know, it's of course as adults we feel entitled to our feelings and our positions in life and anyone who crosses a line, uh, we take it profoundly personal. I don't really know how to answer this question when, um, and part of it really has to do with the fact that I think You know, it's been said that Nelson Mandela used to go for a jog every morning, like around four or five, maybe even earlier. And there would always be a security, uh, a bodyguard that would run behind him. And when this new bodyguard was hired, um, he was informed that 
He should never look at Mandela and ask him how he was doing because then he would be forced to look at his past, look at this country, look at his people and then that would damper his mood and he would just turn around and go back home, he wouldn't jog. And the bodyguard had forgotten uh, that warning. So I think on the first or the second day of meeting Mandela in the morning, he asked him, you know, how he was doing. And Mandela had gotten really, really depressed by the question. And he stopped going for a jog for a few days. You know, there is also this another story about uh, this Sufi and his student sitting and this young kid walks past by them and you know looks at them and says you know hello and they get no response or he gets no response and he finds it to be a little odd that maybe they're both like hard of hearing um, he goes back to them and says hello again and again, no response. He says, well, maybe I should speak a bit louder. And this third time, you know, the volume of his voice goes up. And again, he says hello, but no response. And he stands in front of, you know, these two people. One happens to be like around 65, 70. The other happens to be around 30. And he says, you know, in our tradition, when someone says... Assalamu alaikum, we should say alaikum assalam as a sign of respect. So this old man, the teacher, looks up and says to him, You know, Adam was dead or is dead, Moses is dead, Jesus is dead, Muhammad is dead, and you and I too are amongst the dead. You shouldn't waste your time with the hellos and the goodbyes. Just be mindful. And I think maybe the answer to all the questions that we have really is mindfulness uh, that if you're a little aware of your interior uh, and if you're a little aware of kind of your position within the grand scheme of things there would be little to no arrogance about you You know, and, and it could be something that's been told to you from the outside or it's something that you feel from your own inside. Um, you know, I think if you have pride and it's healthy, I think you could have a healthy dose of arrogance inside you and there is nothing wrong with that. There is nothing wrong with... You know, we had this... I'm sure you, you know this, but... Uh, we wanted Sophia to be taught piano by this Persian woman. And when we talked to her, she said, I can't teach a girl because I'm 50 and I don't have the patience. And it, she didn't come off as arrogance or boastful. Um, she basically was, the way we heard her was that she's at a place in her life where she just doesn't have the patience, you know, um, to kind of work with a five-year-old or a six-year-old or a ten-year-old. She wants someone who's no longer a novice, that she's relatively advanced in the art of playing the piano. Uh, you know, I don't know who's arrogant or not. Uh, I'm sure you can smell arrogance when you when it comes your way. But I think if you're speaking about yourself, You know, Emily, I think when you're writing, 
a good piece of literature, when you're reading a good piece of literature, when you watch a really, really good movie that's meaningful and has substance, uh, there is something about being exposed to these external forces that softens you, that humbles you, that whatever arrogance or pride you may have had initially, these forces have the tendency of removing, removing them from your interior. I think when you kind of become forgetful and you get lost in the busyness of life, um, you know, it's not just arrogance, but there is also a good amount of frustration, anxiety, and anger, and confusion that come about. And I think the only remedy to it really is to kind of live in a very closed off and gated community where you're exposed to only the things that kind of inspire you. Um, I don't know if there is any other way. I don't even know if talking about these things are any good or it does anything. Maybe it does, I'm not quite sure. I just don't know if they have a, you know, a long shelf life. You know, all I know is that the first time when I went and listened to Shajarian give a concert, and it was in San Jose, or San Francisco, and this was after 25 years of the government not allowing any of its musicians to come out of the country. And so when the doors opened and artists were able to kind of travel outside and kind of showcase their art, Shajarian was one of the first ones. And it was such an exciting environment for me. Uh, you know, it was a guy that I worshipped. Um, I wanted to mimic him. Um, and then we were only, you know, a few seats away from the stage. And it was for about two and a half hours. And I was really just glued to my chair. And then I went to another one that was in San, in San Jose. And... And that was the last time I went to any of the concerts. Uh, and it's because I realized that I can listen to these people either on YouTube or I have their tape cassettes, you know, where I can listen in the car. There is no reason for me to sit there in a big hall and simply become excited or inspired just because I see somebody's face. I could just save myself the travel, the expense, and just sit in my room, turn off the lights and uh, listen to these people sing or yeah um, you know if I was to kind of not be at a place where I could simply sit in my room and listen to their music if I was to go to a workshop and ask someone uh, I want to go to a concert to sit to listen and to be inspired so far, you know, they have kind of been all disappointing. How can I kind of change my perspective or attitude a little bit so I could enjoy, you know, all these other concerts I am going to? Um, I think the best answer anyone could give me is, um, you went to Shajarian a few weeks ago and he's the only one who can kind of create that inside you. There is no other. And you can't really manufacture these moments where arrogance leaves you, humility, you know, comes in and stays with you for a few hours. Um, I think the best exercise you can do is kind of just go back in time and kind of figure out those moments, you know, where there wasn't a trace of arrogance inside you, maybe not as intensely or as much. And if you were to pay close you know, attention to those moments, you realize whether maybe you were in a very you know, unique mood that either came from nowhere or came from listening to music or talking to your friends or reading a book or writing something. Um, the rest of the time when those feelings or those external circumstances are not there, you have no choice but to be arrogant, to be forgetful, to lose the humility, the reflectiveness. 
you know, even the idea that the unexamined life is not worth living. I'm not quite sure what sort of a mood you need to be in at all times to be able to examine everything that you do in life. I think it takes a very unique human being uh, to be very mindful, to kind of remember certain things about life, about oneself, about maybe just this, this grand puzzle called life, where every time this part of you that is filled with you know, arrogance, anger, hatred, all the rest of it, uh, they can kind of be tamed by this other part of you that's aware of their own position in the grandness of things. Uh, as far as vulnerability, uh, you know, some temperaments are just born to be very soft. They're created very soft. They break easily. They hurt easy. Uh, they're enormously sensitive. Some temperaments uh, or some people become sensitive because of a certain trauma or a certain experience they've either encountered or experienced in childhood or maybe in you know their young adult life where there are all these trigger points and you know we don't do well with pain so what we do is we cover them up and whenever someone uh, comes into our life knowingly or not they accidentally or maybe knowingly kind of push those buttons and something about us kind of just goes off and then we catch ourselves, and we don't really need to apologize you know to the other person it would be nice but oftentimes you kind of catch yourself and uh, you kind of become embarrassed and ashamed for what you have done uh, in your own eyes and then you know you take some steps and you go to your companion and say I apologize but uh, I think when it comes to being in the social world, you need to be really, really, really tough. Really, really tough. Because knowingly or not, people are there to, without really them wanting to, they just kind of do the wrong things. You know, you pick up the phone, you call a friend, and she accidentally just says something ridiculous that, that offends you or hurts you in some ways. So when you're dealing with the public, when you're walking in the social world, you just need to have a tough skin. You need to be vulnerable when you sit in your room and you read a book or you write poetry or you read poetry or, you know, your intention is walking into your room, shutting off the lights, turning on the music in hopes that you can open up um, and be open to, you know, magic or certain experiences. Um, you know, and there comes a point, I think, in all of our lives where you have enough confidence, and by that I mean you kind of just accept yourself the way you are. You know, eventually I had to come to accept the fact that, you know, I'm just 5'5". Five five. Um, I wanted to be 6'5", but it just ended up being 5'5". Five five. And as soon as I realized that there is nothing I can do about this, it took me some time, but then I just walked society and it was okay. That's just the way things were. And if someone made fun of my, uh, my height, it'd be okay. I remember one time in the classroom, um, I pronounced, I used the word cucumbers, cucumbers, and I still can't pronounce it the right way. And I had a couple of football players that lady making fun of my pronunciation, you know, and I didn't really mind. Uh, but I didn't mind because first I had a full-time job, second I had all these ridiculous degrees, third I had power over them, I could fail them. Um, you know, so I had enough confidence and my life was in a position where I just, uh, I couldn't be offended by these comments that student mates had made about me. Uh, I don't know if any of these, you know, address your question or not. But, you know, be vulnerable. 
only when you're okay with who and what you are and your position in life and when you're alone. Be tough-skinned when you're with people, whether it's your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your parents. Always be tough-skinned. Um, and I know sometimes we just need a shoulder to cry on and we kind of show ourselves to the other person and hope that they don't come back with you know what we have revealed to them to kind of hurt us as far as arrogance You know, Emily, when you're walking this path towards figuring out who you are and what you are, for the lack of a better word or term, the spiritual quest, there is so much confusion and so much loneliness and so much despair in it that almost every part of you has a trigger point. Everyone out there just upsets you. They laugh, it's upsetting. They cry, it's upsetting. They talk, it's upsetting and uh, you feel as if you're being profoundly judgmental and arrogant in the way you approach and you kind of interact with people but I don't really think it's arrogance I just think the path you're on is so horrendously difficult and so frightening that you have no idea what to do with all these emotions and sometimes just, they just run wild like a bulldozer over everything um, you know, and the fact that once in a while you can catch yourself as not having, uh, you know, humility or not having enough respect for the people on the outside, or perhaps you're not evolved enough the way you thought yourself, uh, and so you catch yourself doing these primitive things, and then you kind of make a judgment about yourself, and that's, and it kind of just dampers your mood a little, or maybe for a week. But I think these are just natural things that all of us go through, you know. And no one knows when they'll expire, when the time, when our timetable is, when we kind of just, you know, are past these, um, you know, feeling bad for being open and feeling bad for being arrogant. Anyways, Emily, that's really the best I could do. Uh, I'm sure if you were to go to YouTube and watch Sadhguru and Eckhart Tolle, and uh, maybe the person you should listen to would be Jordan Peterson. I don't really know. God bless you, Emily. Um, Emily, look, you know, you're a researcher. Uh, you're an academician, you know, and, and part of, the biggest part of your job is, you know, you have to stand back in a very detached way and kind of just do your research and not get emotionally involved or entangled. And if you are, you quickly have to detach yourself. You know, I mean, that's what academia is all about. You talk about the Gospels without kind of getting consumed as to how the guy feels on the cross. You basically say, well, yeah, you know, his disciples left him and God abandoned him and he said a few things and he died. And you kind of just talk about this for two hours and uh, people are interested. And if you happen to have some charisma, you can kind of inject some passion into it. But for the most part, you're a scholar. And as a scholar, you have to kind of 
be, uh, you know, a microscope. You kind of put things under this microscope, you study them, you examine them, then you make a report, then you present your report to your audience. You know, if you've been in this business for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, you know how difficult it is for you to actually be attached to anything because your brain is wired to look at everything from a distance, to take notes, and kind of just study the notes. Because if you were to get emotionally entangled, you would be a very, very, very bad researcher, and that's not the way you do it. You know, it's kind of like uh, a therapist when he has or she has someone in their office. You know, I mean, consider what a therapist does. You know, someone goes to the office and after a few meetings there is trust and the patient all of a sudden opens up and uh, kind of just cries, weeps, you know, sometimes loudly, sometimes quietly, but they get consumed by emotions, the patient does. And if the therapist was to join in, you know, it's something that... Uh, you kind of learn when you go to a funeral that when a mother is weeping because her son or her daughter or maybe the wife has lost a husband when they're crying, one of the first things that they teach you is that you can cry sitting next to the mother, but make sure that your crying is not louder than the mother. Mother, You know, she has priority. You know, so as a therapist, you can kind of feel with your patient but your job is not really to kind of get entangled in your patient's emotions. Your job is to kind of, okay, understand, feel, and then sit back once the kind of environment has calmed down, you kind of look at the patient and say, so let me ask you some questions. You know, and these questions have nothing to do with your patient's feelings, but your patient's understanding, their recollection of the recollection of the past and how well they have processed it. And, you know, if you were to look at your life for the past maybe five or so years, you take notes, you read your notes, you revise your notes, you post your notes, you write essays on your notes, you present uh, various ideas to various audiences. That's what you do. And that has become a habit for you. You know, I'm not going to go into this psychological aspect maybe you've been in, in you know a few relationships in the past and they didn't go too well so right now psychologically there is something about you that is very closed off when it comes to intimate relationship I mean those you just leave those aside for now they mean nothing but if you were just to focus on the fact that you are an academician and as an academician who lives amongst other academicians who are really for the most part ridiculous you have no choice but to be walking in this environment emotionless. You know, you don't take things personal. You don't inject your own personal opinions. You kind of just, you know, kind of present them with the material and there it, there it is. And now you're saying, I want to go home. I want to sit next to my husband and my wife or my kids and my this and my that. And I want to be fully involved with them. Well, that's not possible. You know, you've kind of destroyed that that ability inside you, you know, and it doesn't mean that you can't once in a while become intimate or be in an intimate relationship with them, be consumed by how they are, what they are, be consumed by your life. It just means that you won't be able to do that as much unless, you know, you're able to kind of walk away from academia and just focus on your, you know, personal relationships that involve a good amount of emotions where you can kind of become consumed and lost in them and then kind of react to unpleasant experiences then catch yourself then have regret then summon up the courage and the decency to go to your partner and say I apologize I was out of line you know but that's not where you are so if you have been like a Socrates I, mean, I think it's, it's one of the great examples of what it means to live a detached life. You know, you kind of forget that you're naked and you jump out of the window and your students say, Socrates, you know, where are your clothes? Says, oh, I, I forgot. I'm all spirit. I thought I'm no body. But here I am reminding me you guys are the have a body so his disciples have clothes for him. Uh, you know, and, and all he does is just go out there asking questions. You know, his wife 
didn't like him, his kids didn't like him. You know, I don't know if you know anything about Alan Watts. Uh, you know, you would think that people like Alan Watts and some of the other Buddhist philosophers who talk about detachment, who talk about the middle path, that they live a relatively healthy life, at least physically speaking. Alan Watts, you know, um, uh, drank heavily. And when his kids, and he married like four or five times, and when his children talk about Alan Watts, they speak of him as if they really never had a father, you know? It's difficult to go to India to sit, to study, to try to figure out who and what you are, to try to kind of remove emotions from yourself so that they don't be the cause of your sufferings. And you are, you know, there are parts of you that are very, very human. So you go back to England or you go back to Massachusetts, you run into a woman. And it's not the Buddha that's looking at the woman, it's Alan Watts that's looking at the woman. And as a human being, what do you, what do you experience, you know? Instincts kick in. You're attracted to this woman. Desires are blossomed. You go on a few dates and you say to her, do you want to marry me? She says, yes. And it's, you know, a novelty. You're at the very beginning stages of this romantic relationship. Uh, you're not going to be a Buddhist. You're just Alan Watts. You know, once in a while you go to a coffee shop and you can talk Buddhist philosophy, but for the most part you're just, you know, a human being who kind of occupies his time on this date by talking about Buddhism. Uh, when the kind of intensity fades, Alan Watts no longer enjoys Alan Watts. Alan Watts enjoyed being a Buddhist Alan Watts. And that's who and what he's always been. And then the wife doesn't really know what to do and she resents him for changing he begins to resent her for not accepting her, then that forces him to get, you know, a little drunk and a bit more detached, and before you know it, they're divorced. That's just the way things go. Um, I think you should give yourself some credit, Emily, um, that you are detached or you are the way you are because you've been living on the outside, you know. Uh, it may be because of what you've been studying for the past 10 years. It may be because of your past relationships. It may be because of your temperament. You know, I'd like to think that it's not because of your temperament. It's not because of your past relationships. It's really just because of the things you've read and things you're interested in, the ideas. You know, um, so if your detachment is caused because of the things you've been exposed to, I mean, ideas. Um, then eventually, hopefully in time, you'll learn to balance things out. If, you know, it's temperamental or it has to do with your past relationships, that also is something that time will hopefully fix. You know, you will go into them, eventually you'll leave them, and then uh, you, you, very much like myself, will learn your lesson the hard way, that if you don't make some major adjustments to your behavior, to your outlook, uh, you know, life will be somewhat difficult. Emily, can I share with you something? I know you're asleep. Um, no, I'm, I'm awake. Yeah. I'm right here. Yeah. You know, sometimes Sarah and the kids go to uh, her mom's house. Uh, they leave, I don't know, like at 10 in the morning, and uh, they come back home like at 7 or 8 or 9 at night. And that's about 9 or 10 or 11 hours that I am just home by myself. And the truth is I've been alone most of my life. And when I have that much space, that much time where I am alone, I always go back to the person that I've always been. 
and so when they come back um, at seven or eight, it really takes me some time to adjust. It's not because I have you know traumas inside me. It's not because uh, you know my relationship is bad or it's suffering from some issues. The truth is. Naturally, I have a tendency of just being a loner. Uh, but when you get married and you have children, uh, you, you, you can't do that. It's not good for you, it's not good for your kids, it's not good for your wife or your husband. Uh, so it, again, it takes me some time. And uh, it's something that I've come to know about myself that I can't be left alone for too long, otherwise I'll just go back into my cave. And then it'll take me longer to come out. That's just the way I've always been. I'm not going to apologize for it or, you know. And uh, so when that happens, you know, Sarah knows that she just needs to kind of leave me be for a few minutes or a few hours so I could kind of come back out and just be with other people. Um, I don't think I need therapy for it. Uh, I don't think I need to be medicated for it. That's just, just the way I am. And I don't see it really as, a, as an issue because... You know, if you're healthy in other areas of life, I mean, this is just a minor hiccup that will get fixed, you know, in minutes. So nothing to worry about.